All right, let's get started, folks. Um, this next session is novel and cutting edge analytics use cases. And honestly, we had a hard time naming this because as we received, as uh, Max pointed out, we received over 200 abstracts this year, by far the most we've ever had. And a few of those abstracts stood out as really kind of pushing some boundaries of what we thought DHIS2 was actually used for. Um, and how we kind of thought conceptually, you know, DHIS2 should be used or what you could do with some of the analytics. A couple of them were also thinking way beyond just what DHIS2 was and extending DHIS2 into um, new complementary services, um, new compl uh, complementary platforms uh, that I think offer a tremendous amount of new possibilities to, to DHIS2 end users. I think one of the things that we have to appreciate is as we talk about extensibility, us as the DHIS2 platform owner want to connect DHIS2, make sure DHIS2 is connected to as many complementary platforms and systems as possible. Even if those complementary systems and platforms at face value compete with the same core apps that we make in DHIS2. Different use cases require different functionalities. Uh, different use cases require more complex functionalities that we are not going to cover. It's quite often that when we make an extension to DHIS2 or someone in the community brings along an extension of DHIS2, we almost have a bit of a sigh of relief saying, great, now we don't have to do it because we, of course, are very much driven by countries and needs. And we can say DHIS2 is now able to be su support this use case through this complementary extension coming from a third party. And so we have two of those extensions that are going to be presented. But I don't want to bury the lead too much because these presentations, these use cases should well, are going to speak for themselves. And so all I'm going to say is just give you a quick order. So first, we're going to have Carlos from Solid Lines come up. I'm not going to tell you what he can talk about. It's just going to be fun and surprise. Jessica from Frontline 8 is going to be after that. Then Lars, formerly UIO, now BAO Systems, at least for the purposes of this presentation. It's debatable. Uh, it's gonna is gonna come up, and then uh, Valerie and Lance, you guys are gonna follow with uh, from Esri. And so, if you're ready, Carlos, let's jump into it. And so, they're each gonna have about 15 minutes to present, and then we're gonna save two minutes for questions from you guys. Hello, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you very much for coming to to this session. And today, I would like to talk to uh, to talk about the DHS2 usage analytics. That is a data warehouse approach to understanding data use in DHS2. So first of all, I'm Carlos Tejo Alonso. I'm working as data engineer for Solid Lines, and uh, this will be the agenda of today's presentation. So we'll start talking about what is the situation, what is the problem. Uh, after that, we are going to see what is the current situation. We'll uh, share what is the envisioning of a, a data analytics data platform. After that, we'll see uh, what is the DHS2 usage analytics in the uh, analytics data platform. I was planning to do a demo, but uh, hopefully, uh, not hopefully, but sadly, it's not possible. But maybe uh, during the after the session, we can. Uh, have a moment to to sit, and after, uh, at the end the key takeaways. So, what is the problem? Uh, sometimes, in order to take uh, informed decisions, we need to know how our DHS2 users are navigating uh, through the system, if they're using the visualizations, if the dashboard are used or not used. So right now. There is a, an app in DHS2. I don't know if it's core or not. We call, can call core app. That is the usage analytics. Uh, the functionality is improving uh, in every release. Um, for mo many of the cases, this is enough. But sometimes you need more. An extra need is required, depending on the partners. For instance, some of our partners request, OK, we want to use our own dashboards using another BI tool. Or we want to uh, triangulate information using DHS2, but also the system logs or external data, image climate data, or uh, something unstructured like 
the test from the interpretations. For the case of the DHS2 uh, usage analytics, we are using the system logs. Okay, we'll see that later on. So, how we envision how to uh, address this extra need? We envision that in something bigger that we call the analytics data platform. That is something that is external to DHS2. DHS2 is just a part, a source, an input. It's vendor agnostic. You don't have to, to address to a particular uh, cloud environment. Could be on-premise, AWS, Azure, whatever. The DHS2 usage analytics is just a part of this analytics data platform. And we try to, to follow the best practice about uh, data standards, uh, modeling, and so on. So let's talk a little about the architecture. The architecture, we have different data sources. DHS2 is one of them, pulling many uh, other uh, DHS2. More things that could come are like fire, uh, database, model information, CSV, log files. And we put them together in a data lake, in a data repository, a big hard drive. And from that, we select what we want and create a data warehouse. And from that data warehouse, external BI tools are using it to, generic, uh, to generate the dashboards and at the end, answer the questions that we want. What is the, the flow, the, the data flow? So, well, I, I already mean mentioned it, but we have the data sources and in the data lake repository, we are pulling the information from the data sources and we put it like as raw data. After that could be, could be in some cases, uh, some pipelines some scripts that transform this information uh, for as created data or staging to be used in the next step. And the next step is to create a data warehouse with mainly with a star model and fill it with information. And the last part is to use the BI tool that as you prefer, maybe in one panel prefer superset or the panel preferred Power BI or the panel preferred Tableau. And using that data model, connect with the BI tool and generate the visualization that you want. So uh, again, the parts, ETL process, extract information, transform the information, create the model, fill it, create a visualization, and after that, use that information in uh, like publishing to your uh, customer share with uh, some organization that you need it or and, and as usual prefer uh, using the your preferred BI tool. What type of, of data can be the input of this uh, data lake? Everything that you, you can have in your in your system that could be available. From our experience, we, we have seen data from the HS2, but also from Cobo Toolbox, from Fire, from Moodle, MongoDB, other databases, and other potential data sources that we were playing with, server logs. There is a lot of information in the servers, as we will see later in the particular case of the uh, DHS2 usage analytics. In the Tonka, the Nginx, DHS2, social media, data from uh, Instagram, from Meta, TikTok, data from climate, about climate, demographics, weather, or like free test conversations that the comments on Facebook, uh, a conversation in a chatbot, the interpretation that you can uh, feel in the HS2 about the visualization. Okay, so the DHS2 usage analysis is a particular case of this analytic data platform. What is the objective? As I mentioned at the beginning, imagine, I want to know if my visualizations, uh, how many people are, are uh, seeing my visualization. Is my dashboard being used? Maybe if, maybe there's a problem. Or we are going to upgrade 
from version 2.38 of the HS2 to version 40. Maybe it's the moment to select which custom apps should continue. How can I know if people are using this app or not? Maybe we can ask them, but maybe we can know it from the system logs. And what are the data source of these DHS2 user analytics? System logs, okay, uh, that uh, contains information about what MPI endpoints are used, parameters that are in the in the request, times, device, browser. We can know if the the calls are coming from an Android app or from a desktop device. The server response, if there is many conflicts, maybe to, to start to, to think about if there is a problem. Okay, so as mentioned, input data for the model that I'm going to show you later. In that case, is Nginx server logs with an extra development okay, that I will explain later. And data from the HS2. Uh, in order to prepare better reports, because from the server logs, you can obtain the UID, but maybe the UID is not going to be really fancy in a report. So maybe you can link the UID to a, a name that you can obtain from the visualization or from the dashboard uh, metadata, also from the user and, and user groups. So what we have in our data repository, we have at the end files that we are collecting from the system, uh, the access log, the user activity logs, that is an enhanced uh, access log that also contains the username of the of the use the HS2 user that are uh, creating or or uh, doing that request to the to the system, and also we have well these are your folders because inside these folders there are the 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 metadata about dashboard user group user and visualizations, and the user login in order to know how many people logging in in the server. So this is the typical. Uh, Nginx uh, access log. Uh, you can see that at that time, there was a request to that visualization from, we don't know, because that part is missed. Uh, we do a extra step in the Nginx in order to put the, the username. That's what we call the user activities. So we were able to put, uh, I, I put the XXS, Y, Z, but this is the, the username that at that time, that visualization, that was the username. And we are using the cookie to do the matching. And at the end, with that information, we create this, uh, this model uh, in order to fill that information. So we have login activity dashboard and activity visualization that are the, uh, the FAC uh, tables and the dimension tables that are user the dates and visualization and user group. And this is just an example, okay, of what we can do, because in that case, we are just focusing in, in, that, in that example in the dashboard and visualization, because here we can see different dashboards that maybe are not using this particular visualization, because maybe they are using another, because the uh, their needs are different. So here, what we have is API calls to the the access to server, the number of unique users. We can see if the information the, they are coming from Android or using another device, the amount of data, and if there are uh, server error or client errors, and the and the method. Also, we can uh, define uh, the the filter of the time, as we have the dimension of the of the date. This is same same but different because at the end here we are going to focus more on the on the endpoint, and we can select, for instance, we want to know uh, all the server errors that uh, are linked to a post, and we can see what are the endpoints that are uh, res responding to, to that error. And the 
most accurate to the to the case of the uh, usage analytics is this one. Uh, in that case, we have the the dashboards, uh, and we can see the number unique of people that are accessing dashboards in seven days. In uh, well, depends on the on the range of dates, and also we can select okay from that user groups which dashboard people are are seeing, and we can do it because the information is interconnected in the in the data model. The demo, uh, maybe talk about, well, uh, as mentioned, the demo. Uh, we don't have time now for a demo, but after we can we can do it maybe in the expert launch somewhere, find a place. So the main uh, takeaways of uh, this conversation could be like the analytic data platform that we are presenting here is something that you cannot think in terms of a project. Oh, we have this money for this project. Let's think about with this, no, you need to think about maybe like organizational, something that is across the whole organization. Logs, system logs contain a lot of information that can be used to analyze the behavior of users in DHS2. We are using different techniques in order to transform the data, like Python, uh, Python scripts, uh, Azure Data Factory pipelines, uh, Spark, many things. Everything is possible. It's possible to use external data to triangulate with the not with DHS2 data, also uh, system logs. So everything that you can match can be uploaded to the data lake and can be put on the on the data model. And adding the extra step of creating a data warehouse increase the complexity of the process. But in terms of flexibility for the future, it allows you to do more things. And I think the, thank you all for your time. And um, yeah, tomorrow we'll have also a poster that we can talk about this. Thank you. Any uh, questions for Carlos? Oh, Test. Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm Emily with um, the MSF section Amsterdam, and I wanted to know if with this analysis you can also check which data elements or indicators are mostly used. It depends how this information is, uh, how can I say, pushed to the system. But if you use, for instance, you use tracker capture, at each time there is a, a change in a data element, there is a put in the database, you can see it. Actually, here, the, the last. There is a put in a in that event in that data element, so you can know if there is a change there. And would it also be possible from the analysis side? So, because we kind of want to see which of our data elements and indicators that we have in the system are actually also used. So I don't know to see if they are being used in the data visualizer or on the dashboards. So, uh, like one part of that element is how to people are collecting the data and the other how to people is using the data. In terms of indicators, uh, maybe this possible. It, it will depend maybe just with the visualization. If you are link, you have the link between which visualization is linked to that uh, proper indicator, the link is done. So you can select, okay, from that, that element, have this visualization, how many people many people are using these visualizations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Carlos, you have a poster tomorrow. And do you all know what he looks like now? <laughs> Track him down. And then we'll go ahead and hand it over to Jessica. Hello. Hi, thanks. 
Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jessica. I work for an NGO called Frontline Aids. At Frontline Aids, we use a monitoring and evaluation methodology called outcome harvesting. If there's any m &E people in the room, you may be familiar. I'm going to be speaking about how we use DHIS2 to capture and to analyze these qualitative outcomes from our work. So to give a bit of background to Frontline Aids and what we do, um, Frontline Aids is the largest partnership of civil society organizations working to end HIV and AIDS. I'm sure everyone in the room will know that there are millions of people around the world that are denied prevention, testing, and treatment. So we work with our partners on the front line to break down the legal, social, and political barriers that people face. And we have a global plan of action which sets out our priority actions, um, which are prevention, integration, human rights, innovation, community health and system strengthening, and youth engagement. So outcome harvesting is a qualitative monitoring and, evalu and evaluation methodology. It identifies and analyzes the changes that have been brought about through our work. So it collects evidence of the changes that have happened and then we work backwards to assess what our contribution has been to these changes. An outcome is defined as a change in a social actor's behavior that's significant and that has been plausibly influenced by our work. So the focus is not on what we've done, but the focus is about what somebody else is doing differently because of the work that we've done. The social actors that we are seeking to influence through our sphere of work include partners, donors, national governments, UN agencies, community-based organizations, health service providers, and the police. Uh, when we develop um, our outcome statements, they have three parts. So the description of the change that's happened, uh, the significance, why it's important, and what our contribution has been to this change, um, and also the contribution of others. Here are some examples of our outcomes from our work. Um, so we have outcomes at lots of different levels. So it could be um, a change that's happened at the UN level, or it could also be a very small uh, community. Um, yeah, lots of different levels of change that, that, we're, that we're working with. So we use this methodology to measure progress towards our theory of change. So we do this at organizational level as well as at program level. Uh, we chose this methodology because it's well suited to advocacy and policy where the environment is complex. We don't always know at the beginning the specific goals that we're, that we're working to achieve. Um, and it's useful when there's multiple actors working towards the same goals because it allows us to analyze what our contribution has been in relation to the contribution of others. So at Frontline Aids, we've been using DHIS2 since 2020 uh, on a variety of different programs. Um, so we have tracker programs which follow clients that are receiving HIV and SRHR services. We also use DHIS2 for our community-led monitoring work. Um, so this is a program called REACT, which documents human rights violations and responses, which is then used as evidence um, to influence change. So we know that DHIS2 was not designed to capture these kinds of qualitative stories like our outcomes, but we were already using it um, for um, other, other programs, other areas of work. Um, staff were already familiar with the system, and up until now we had really good feedback um, from staff on DHIS2. So we decided to think about how DH DHIS2 might be able to meet our needs as essentially a database for our outcomes, um, rather than introduce two different m &E systems for different kinds of data. And outcome harvesting is inherently collaborative. It will only work if staff um, collaborate and enter their outcomes into the system. So having a system, having their buy-in is, is really important. Uh, so we decided to build an event program called our Outcome Journal to manage and store our outcomes. So staff working in advocacy and programs enter their outcomes as and when they come across them. 
And then us in the monitoring, evaluation and learning team, uh, we will review them, we'll categorize them, um, we'll often further develop and refine them. So we use a simple program rule to control what us in the m and &E team see and what other staff members see. Um, this is useful so the form isn't too long and complicated for our users. Um, we also found that we're, as we're in the process of developing the outcome and refining it, the comments feature has been really helpful because we can just write a quick update on where we are um, in that process. And then we'll then code the outcomes by social actor, the kind of social actor that's been influenced, the key population group uh, that's, that will benefit from the change, um, the level of change as well. So whether it's happened at national, subnational or regional level. So what we're essentially doing is creating quantitative data from the qualitative data, because from that coding, we now have things that we can count. Uh, so this is our dashboard. So it shows how many outcomes we have in each stage um, of the, the development process and tables showing the number of outcomes per kind of social actor influenced level of change, um, contribution significance rating, which is ratings that we give um, for the different outcomes that we have. At the moment, it's really just us in the monitoring and evaluation team that use this dashboard, but we would like to explore how it can be useful for other staff members as well. So then we use Data Visualizer to uh, visualize um, this now quantitative uh, data. Uh, and this is really useful because this allows us to identify trends and patterns in a set uh, of outcomes and answer questions like what kind of social actors are we influencing, which social actors have we not been able to influence, which programs are leading to outcomes or which areas of work are we not seeing outcomes. So we can see from this chart here that um, the, the changes that we're seeing have been happening in our frontline aids partners um, and then national governments. And the level of change where we're seeing our outcomes is at national level. And these analysis are used in stakeholder workshops that we have um, in outcome harvesting. This is called a sense making process. This is where partners look at how a set of outcomes can help to answer um, some learning questions that are identified um, at the beginning of the process. Uh, and these analyses are really helpful for helping to inform uh, these discussions. So the benefits and limitation of using DHIS2 for this work, um, I see the main benefit is definitely the analysis capability, being able to quantitatively analyze and visualize um, the outcomes is really insightful and in allowing us to see how change is happening and how we're contributing to it. Um, the system is really user-friendly. All staff can do this and we only need a short training um, for them to be able to do that. Um, and we've had really great feedback on how easy it is to enter data into the system. We also can automatically generate a unique code per outcome. So when we first started doing this work, we asked staff members to use the search, search function um, for the keywords to do with their outcomes to see if it was already in the system. But we were still getting duplicates, I think, just because you can use lots of different language to describe um, an outcome, describe a change. So we realized that we needed to, to generate codes. Um, and this is something that we were already doing via program rules for our other programs. Um, so it was something that we introduced for this. Um, something that we didn't realize we needed at the beginning when we were designing it, but um, it was lucky that DHIS2 had, has this functionality. Moving on to limitations, um, because as far as I know, there's no way to track edits um, in the Capture app. This means that when we're in the process of developing and refining an outcome, we copy and paste it into Word to be able to do that. So a staff member will enter their outcome. I will then paste it into Word, uh, track edits, add comments, and then send it back to them as a Word document before then putting it back into DHIS2. 
Um, this, yeah, it's just additional time and we also have to be careful about version control. Also, as far as I know as well, there's no way to link events in Capture. Um, five minutes to drop. Um, so a lot of our outcomes are related. So for example, there could be a partner that's been invited to sit on a technical working group. And then through that technical working group, they were successful in influencing the language in a policy. These would be two connected outcomes that we have. Um, I know it's possible to connect clients in Tracker. If it was possible to do this um, in Capture, we would be able to better see the journey of change, I think. Um, and when we generate event reports, we can't see from there the comments that we've entered um, on our outcomes. Um, yeah, that's it from me. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions on quantifying qualitative data? It's not an inspired need, and maybe we should force our masters and PhD students to use DHS to, to, uh, to do their data analysis. Any questions? <laughs> for that presentation. Uh, have you considered the possibility if this gets, it, it seems like it's still a very small program for now. If it goes to scale and it's a lot more data, have you considered perhaps integrating with sort of like Atlas or something that does qualitative uh, data, like a system outside and then pushing the data back into DHIS2 for your analysis, like integrating with an actual uh, statistical um, qualitative um, software? Uh, no, we haven't, but let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> it goes back to <laughs> like, yeah, like in vivo or something like that, it might have. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, we're also trying to look at in an event program, an aspect of bringing in multiple users into a single event. And it sounds like you've looked at that process and architected a, a, a solution that includes your supervisors for the review and then that coding aspect. I'm just curious of the ways in which you went through your research process of that. And it seems like what you wound up with is a single data element that you've selected and then it it displays something below. It, I, I'm curious about the <clears throat> hiding or visibility of that specific DE or limiting that functionality to allow for those things to also appear below or if you've dealt with that. Or when we generate the unique code for the... No, I think it's, if, I, if I'm understanding correctly, there's there's an initial entry and then there's a secondary coding that's yeah. happening. Uh, yeah. And so it's that secondary coding. So it's like, Two, it's like an event, but it has two different points of entry as well, right? Yeah, um, we just have a tick box, which we will tick when we go into, we would go into the event, click it, and then that will display uh, the additional fields. So in the first point of entry, the, they could do that. And if it was really information that we didn't want them to see, then we, you know, we would use another way, but yeah, that's how we've done it. Hi. Uh, thanks. This is Colt. Can you, well, I don't know if you did this, but was there a reason why you didn't use tracker in this sort of model? Because it seems like what you've done is you have uh, a tracked entity, which is an organization. You have a sort of workflow or a series of objectives that are trying to be met in some sort of logical process, which aren't sense those are individual events that could be created into a program right um you have the ability to add comments within that and then create you know a, a record of this a, this entity over time so i just am wondering why there was uh no decision to go with the tracker program no it's a good question um we didn't go with tracker i guess because whilst our outcomes can be connected. We conceptualized it as being more kind of once only events kind of thing. So we thought it would be better suited um, to an event program. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Antoine Legrand. I'm uh, a colleague of Alars working for BioSystem. 
and I will introduce that uh, that um, talk. Uh, and so an ethics challenge from the field. So the idea is to give you uh, an ideal example of the work we're doing today uh, in Senegal, uh, DRC, and Rwanda. And I will mainly focus for the introduction uh, on Senegal and, and DRC. Just before I start, um, what, if I remember well, one day someone told me like a good tech solution is a solution that answers a problem, <laughs> uh, except if you're doing blockchain, but we are not doing blockchain. So let me give you uh, some background. So we are today supporting um, the Senegal MOH uh, um, on an interoperability integration project and also working in the DRC supporting the provincial uh, health team. And they both have two analytics questions that are very similar. Uh, in, in one case, they were asking us, can we measure MHA services availability? Uh, and one of the questions, like our indicators, is that us, they ask us to, to build was the number of health facility ready to provide uh, MNCH services. And on the other case, they were asking us, if we can help them to measure uh, as workers workload and staffing needs on one of the metrics we use was the proportion of assisted delivery in our facility. So two very, two similar questions or challenges. And if we look at, uh, look at it like more closely, um, we have in both case, like a reference to facility that needs to, uh, you need to take like the information from the master facility list. So you need like information about the facility type and, and location and other information about facility. Um, then we have, what is the MNH services and the number of assisted delivery? Typically, as the, the information that you can get uh, from a routine information system such as DHS2. Uh, in that case, that will be the number of services provided by uh, facility type. Um, at the end, we have also proportion uh, and what does it mean ready to provide? So, how can we measure that um, the fact that the health facility is ready to give a services? and how many delivery has been assisted. And for that, you need to know where are uh, the, the health staff. Uh, do we have enough health staff in facilities? Uh, in this country, in DRC and Senegal, they are using IRIS uh, as a software for managing human resources data. But to, to be honest with you, there's also other source of data we need to, uh, to use, such as the health map uh, that gives you the norms uh, for um, health staff type, by health staff type for each facility. Uh, you have wrap-up data and so on. So we're in a case where we have to work with different sources of data, um, different um, technology and software. So what are the challenges or what were the challenges? Uh, it looks like a very classic integration use case uh, where you have like siloed system and certain like fragmentation in the governance of the different system. Uh, you have one team behind Iris, one team behind DHS2, another team behind the other um, uh, subsystem we're working for, we're working with. Uh, we have to deal with uh, uh, and data, metadata, meaning that we you have to work uh, between the system to recompose and combine all the all the data, uh, especially because there is a lack of norm and standards uh, in the in these two country at the information system level. Uh, that make the work of integrating and recombining the data quite cumbersome uh, mm -hmm. and, and difficult. But that's, I would say, pretty common uh, challenge when we are working with integration. Uh, but we also have other requirements or challenges. Um, these two projects ask us to really focus on how can we uh, improve and enable data access and use. So that, that's great to be able to integrate multiple data sources, but at the end, we need to make sure that end user can really use the data for decision making. Um, in Senegal, personally, they ask us uh, to deploy a solution on premise in the data center. Uh, that was one of the technical challenge. But in both cases, they wanted us to um, keep the HS2 as the main data access point. What does it mean? Uh, country has spent so much resources to train people on the HS2 and to maintain end user in the HS2 environment. And bringing another app uh, mean for them to train people on other technology, having another logging and, and so on. But also if ministry of us understand that they can use other tools to ease the integration, they want at the end to have a subset of this integrated data 
in their main source here, which is the HSU. So what we've done, uh, trying to answer that, uh, that, that um, challenges, and last will uh, give you a lot of technical details about this, um, this uh, solution. And we have chosen to take a platform approach. So we have deployed an approach that has been designed as an extension of the HS2. Okay, so very quickly, um, this, this platform helps us to ingest different sources, like from the HS2, IRIS, MFR, or any other um, um, uh, subsystem that exists. Uh, for that, we can leverage uh, different connectors. And then within this platform, we can process, recombine, and store the data. But then the result of that work mm -hmm. can be then uh, pushed to uh, the HS2. So at least you have a subset of integrated data in the HS2. Of course, once you've done the integration, then you want to use it. Uh, you can, of course, use the DataViz app, but sometimes it's not enough. Uh, so people ask us if they can like use BI tools. Uh, and we started with the DRC, and uh, they were used to work with Power BI. So we've connected Power BI uh, to that platform. But I want them to say, oh, the problem is Power BI. First, you need to pay for the license. This is very costly. So if once you scale uh, your solution, that, that will um, represent a major investment. The second one is how people in districts or in the province are used to work with the HS2 and within the, the HS2 environment. So do you think you can like embed um, Power BI in the HS2? Uh, and then Senegal uh, a case arrived and say, we don't want Power BI, do you have an open source alternative? We say, yes, Superset exists. And they ask the same question. We want to retain our end user in the HS2. And so we start to discuss with the last and the rest of the BR team, can we embed Superset in the HS2? Uh, and that will be what last year <laughs> we'll talk about. Just to <laughs> show you uh, one other dashboard, as you like to see, this one has been done for uh, the Ministry of Health in Senegal um, in Superset. It's now available in the, the HSU environment that show you uh, the, the workloads for different m and services, such as like the um, uh, burst, assisted burst, and that help the team to identify gaps in staffing needs in the entire country. So they are using that dashboard to see where they have um, the biggest problem in terms of human resources. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, thanks, Antoine. So I think it's fair to say that almost every organization, every country you work with, kind of struggle with uh, the same problems, right? Does it look familiar? <laughs> and one struggle with this stuff? I think everywhere we go, we struggle with, you know, system integration. Um, data exchange seems to always be the topic. Track it to aggregates, always a problem. People have lots of tracking data and they want aggregates. Uh, people want real time, right? People always want, even if the data is not clear, people want real time um, right now. Um, people want flexible cross-program tracker analytics. People have data in different programs and now they want to do analysis across all the programs. And finally, I think we see many places now, countries are collecting data over 10, 15 years, maybe 20 years. Um, many countries also struggle with sort of archiving or offloading old, old data. So getting rid of data, having not having these two being kind of congested with more and more data. So at BO, then we kind of face the same problems everywhere, right? Every project, every country having the same trouble. So instead of now creating like one-off solutions, you know, hacks or scripts or, ha or, or apps for every little problem, at BO, we try to think, can we make a platform? Right. So instead of building the same solution, the same connectors, the same scripts over and over and over, we tried to kind of think about it from a, from a platform perspective. Um, and that was how the analytics platform was started. It's a platform for data integration and embedded data analytics. As we're going to see soon, um, it is an extension of DHS2. So it's not another thing. It's not another thing you have to sort of onboard users and train people and roll it out and all, do all that. Um, we make it free and open source for uh, low and middle income uh, countries and governments forever. Um, it's built on open source technologies like Postgres, ClickHouse, which is a very fast uh, columnar data warehouse, and Superset, which is a very good open source data exploration tools, Apache Superset. It can be deployed on-premise in country data centers, if that's what you want, in the cloud, 
or as a managed SaaS offering by, by BU. So I know we only have 10 minutes. I'm uh, probably five. <laughs> okay. So um, the platform basically lets you do data pipelines, views um, to join data, destinations to push data back into the SaaS2. We have workflows for orchestration of jobs. We have custom data quality checks, and we also have embedded uh, supersets data exploration. So super quick, it's a growing uh, platform. We have 12 uh, countries and NGOs using it at the moment, and it's quickly, quickly growing. We have built turnkey connectors for systems used in, in our space, right? So instead of people having to develop, you know, a Comcare connector or a Cobol connector, an ODK connection over and over and over, we have built like turnkey connectors for this thing. So people can just go in, you configure it through the user interface, and then data starts flowing. So the data flow in a kind of a complex integration scenario looks something like this. So we have at the bottom there, you will see we have uh, many instances of DHS2. It could be many tracker instances, many aggregates. We have, for instance, Comcare. There could be ODK instances. Um, we have Iris, uh, very popular. Bima, there's custom you know, CSV files, Excel sheets. We can now build this thing and kind of integrate them together without doing coding. So no more like Python hacks and so on, straight into the platform. Um, we're using the data pipelines, data goes into the lake, into the warehouse, which is typically ClickHouse. You can connect with your BI tools and all that. And we can also embed data within DHS2 without having to go outside. So when you create a new DHS2 data pipeline, for instance, again, like there's no coding, you just give it a name, a description, a schedule for when you want to refresh it, the URL to the API, the connection details for your database. Um, you can filter by data type, so aggregate data, we support programs and metadata. This is also real time continuous. So it's like data shows up one to two minutes after it's been entered into Tracker. We can filter by data element groups, organets, and then you define which schema and table name that you want to put this data into your warehouse. Um, we also have upload of ad hoc data sets. If you have CSV uh, files with different you know, data types, columns and so forth, you can upload it straight away, it becomes data. Um, we can control access by data set, very similar to DHS2 by keeping private, sharing with specific people, um, and sharing with uh, selected. Moving on. Um, once the data is in the platform, we can use what we call views to join the data. Here we need to write a little bit of SQL. Um, SQL is not so hard. Even ChatGPT can help you with uh, SQL these days. So it's not something to, to worry too much about. We have a very nice SQL editor that has autocomplete. So you can kind of just start writing and it will suggest the names. You can see the schema of the warehouse on the left. And this is purely web-based. So you can go in, have a look, play with it, create SQL, have autocomplete, preview the data, and so forth. We also support custom data quality checks, not just metadata checks, but data checks. So if you need to write custom checks against your data, you can also do that now, such as outlier detection and so forth. Um, here's a quick example of how you can do that with uh, uh, sort of uh, standard or modified set score. Then we have destinations. So once you've done all this, you integrated all your data sources, you've done the views to do the filtering, et cetera. Now you can push data back into DHS2 if that's what you want. That's what where we use what they call the destinations. So again, like no coding, you set up a name, description, when you want it to run, you select a view, you point at your DHS2 instance, username, password, or API token, and it flows back into DHS2. And again, no, no coding. And once you've done all this, we also have workflows. So workflows, is what you use to orchestrate everything. So now we can put together, for instance, uh, a few data pipelines to pull data in from different systems. Um, and then at the end of the day, we can combine with views and destination and have everything run together in an orchestrated way, pulling in data at night, for instance, from, from a variety of sources. Um, so we talked about BI tools uh, several times here today already. Um, of course, you can connect your Power BI, you can connect your fancy BI tools, but what we often very often see is that people don't want another thing, right? If you are a country in Africa and you have thousands of users in the field that have been trained on DHS2, that work at the facility, you don't really want to train them again on another thing, right? It's another thing to roll out, another thing to use their accounts. You have to train people on BI tools and so forth. Hard to do at scale. So what we thought in, in uh, at BO was that we can instead try to bring the best of both worlds. So we can take Superset, which is a very nice open source data exploration tool, and then embed it straight into DHS. So 
this is a high level overview how it, how it works. We have a new app in DHS2 called uh, Super BI, which connects, we have a proxy, we connect to a gateway, which is a kind of a microservice, um, connects to superset, which again, connects to the data warehouse and we're using the DHS2 data pipeline to suck the data in over to click asset night. And everything here is automatic and real time, real time as in one to two minutes delay. So the cool thing now is that once you've done all this stuff, we can go into superset, we can create these visualizations. So we have bubble charts and whatnot within here. And here is like flexible SQL, remember all the views, we can do whatever we want. We can join programs, we can pull in data from Iris, we can do tracker analytics, we can do tracker to aggregate, we can create exploration, um, data visualization on top, and boom, you can put it straight into the HS2. So now it becomes just another app. It looks very much like the dashboard app. This one is called Super BI. Um, this is what you do to embed your visualization straight into the HS2. So no more secondary user accounts. There's nothing to train people on in terms of another set of user accounts, another set of licenses to buy, um, new trainings, new academies. It's just there, another app in the HS2. But the data is actually coming from ClickHouse and Superset, but it just, it looks as if it's inside DHS2. So for end users, it's just another app inside DHS2. So this really kind of adds to the power of DHS2. DHS2 is a fantastic tool when it comes to you know, KPIs, uh, key performance indicators and so forth. Uh, but you know, there's a million ways you may want to look at the data. And we always keep pushing the DHS2 developers and we keep saying, oh, can we please add this and this and this and this feature to the program indicator? So can we please add this and this and this visualization type? And poor Scott here, like he's trying to, you know, support data visualization for, for uh, 90 something countries now, which is a tall order. So in those cases where we can actually then use a more flexible data exploration tools, embed it straight in to augment the DHS2 analytics, then it becomes really powerful. So once again, this is like flexible data analytics directly integrated in DHS2 with superset. End users are just gonna see another DHS2 web app. So there's nothing that you need to roll out in terms of new systems. Existing use DHS2 user accounts, same username, password, just another app. Um, data is queried straight in the warehouse and data can be against, you know, iris or Comcare data or tracker data. It doesn't even have to be in DHS2. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and of course, near real time. ClickHouse is super fast. It's a column oriented data warehouse, meaning it's much faster than Postgres when it comes to analytical queries. So it's also near real time. Uh, we tried it in Rwanda. How many minutes do I have, uh, Scott? <laughs> okay. So I just want to show you some super quick um, examples. So in Rwanda, we actually use this now. Ulob and I went there a few weeks ago to, to use it for moving tracking data to aggregate. That has been the main problem in many countries. We have tracking data, now it has to be aggregate data. So what we do in typically in these two is that we start to set up like a million program indicators, right? And we have to map them everywhere and do all the kind of gymnastics to get it into data. In Rwanda, we managed to do um, the, in, Rwanda has a real-time tracking program for immunization. They actually type it in, ask the patients or, or the kids come and to get immunized. And they have about 7 million events, something like that. So, but instead of setting up a million indicators for doing tracker to aggregate, we actually managed to get it down to two views within the AP uh, against ClickF. So, so this is a base view in SQL. It's a bit Greek. I don't know how many speak SQL here, but it's not too complicated, right? We can see here that we're doing some mapping to, uh, to a category option combination based on under one year and above one year. We have uh, measles, we have uh, IPV, we have BCG and so forth. So we're creating the base view, age in days, you can see, so we can kind of measure and then the next view, this is again SQL in the SQL editor. Um, we're doing a couple of queries to basically aggregate up to uh, aggregate data. So here we have one query for BCG, one for IPV, one for MR1. And then you can see the result down there. This is coming up. It took for the entire database in Rwanda, one, 0 0.1 second <laughs> to produce everything. 0 0.1 second to do aggregate to tracker. And then we use a destination and a workflow to push it back into the HS2. Uh, and everything is just two fairly modest SQL use like this, instead of having to create thousands of thousands of stuff inside the HS2 and have it run at night for hours and hours. So, so this was quite interesting. Um, we're gonna try it for TB and HIV and also the, uh, soon. So once all this stuff was set up, we can set a workflow. Uh, we set up a data pipeline to get in the epi data. Uh, we used the view that we just looked at. We used the destination to push it back into the HS2. 
And then you have this nice little workflow uh, that can orchestrate this whole thing and run continuously, even continuously. Um, and again, very little coding beyond a little bit of SQL. Um, so once again, just another app in DHS2. You can create it. We, we set up a new dashboard with a title and an uh, ID linking to superset. Uh, we can look at it like this. We can look at, this is uh, immunization low-level data. So this is analytics coming straight from tracker, not no pre-aggregation, straight from immunization data. Um, and of course, then quickly embed it into DHS2. So here we don't even have to pre-compute to aggregate data, just coming straight from the, from the source, so to speak. Same with Iris. In Senegal, we set it up on top of Iris. Iris doesn't really have a lot of visualization tools. So now we can do this straight either in Superset or inside DHS2. And the, the Iris guys were super happy because now they can actually look at their own data. 10 seconds. And of course, Power BI is also very BI tool agnostic. If you have other tools like, uh, like yeah, Power BI, Tableau, you can also connect those as well. Thank you very much. So one or two very quick questions. Yeah, I mean, I would say everything is really possible here. Uh, we're also working on integrating like Jupyter Notebooks and Python, if that's what you need to do. Uh, we're working on, I mean, so if you run this in the cloud, the cool thing is that I didn't say this, but this can be hosted both on premise in a country data center. It's also, it, it can also be deployed on, on Azure and AWS. So the moment you have your data in an S3 bucket in AWS or a blob storage in, in Azure, there's almost like no limitations, right? Because there's an endless um, SaaS offerings now for cloud within Azure and AWS. So, so if you are in the cloud, I would say the possibilities are endless because now your data is in the cloud and you can utilize all of these things. Uh, again, we're working on Python, um, Jupyter Notebook support, where you can use all these like wonderful uh, Python libraries like NumPy and all these things. So yeah, I would say it's it's possible. Yeah, just a very quick one. Uh, like I know, like you can you can have the destination to try to put the the data in back in, yep. but you also have uh, directly we can connect to superset, right? Yeah. So, which can actually deal with multiple DHS too. My yep. point was like we can can we use the user uh, access control of the different uh, DHS too, so that like only selected user can view that one because that is something which is needed yep. instead of pushing the data back into DHS too. You mean if users can look at data in you can or cannot can yeah yeah you can yes 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 oh yeah yeah um so we don't really have single sign-on yet um between these two right so it's still two user accounts um, but we were also working on that. I mean, we we do actually well, we do actually support that now. We did support Okta last week. <laughs> so I mean, I think this is a bigger discussion. DHS2 itself supports single sign-on uh, with OpenID Connect, meaning you can use Keycloak, Azure Entra, uh, different kind of providers, uh, Okta and so forth. And AP supports single sign-on. So I would say you can do that. There's definitely a way to do it. This is another big topic. I think countries should start to move towards single sign-on now with so many DHS2 instances and things like this and government systems and superset and whatnot. It's better if we start moving towards single sign-on, uh, but that's a bigger discussion. Yeah. Um, hello everyone. My name is Lance Owen. I am the Global Public Health Portfolio Lead at Esri. And my name is Valerie DeRosier. I am a solution engineer for Global Public Health at Esri. And together we sort of represent the global health work at um, our company, which is the company behind the ArcGIS uh, platform. Um, we recognized pretty recently that it was gonna be really important in our work to support global health that we become interoperable uh, with DHIS2 given uh, their footprint and profile in the world. Um, so we have been working on an, an interoperability project um, so that our users, um, our GIS users and DHIS2 users um, can use our system to augment their experience of DHIS2 and sort of pick up where the mapping application, the excellent mapping application that exists in DH, DHIS2 um, leaves off. 
Um, just to give you a very brief overview, because I'm not I'm not sure that everyone is that familiar with GIS software. So the ArcGIS um, system, which is our primary product, is a comprehensive geospatial system. And what that means, and the, sort of the benefit of that, is that it includes um, several components that all work together and are, are all completely interoperable out of interoperable out of the box. So there is a desktop application, ArcGIS Pro. And that's probably what most people are most familiar with as a desktop application in which they do mapping. Um, but that is also augmented by an online SaaS offering called ArcGIS Online. These two systems talk together um, seamlessly. And then um, a series of mobile apps and web apps that you can create and use in conjunction with those two components. And the demo that Valerie is about to show you is going to um, demonstrate how those all work together. Yeah, thanks, Lance. So today I'm going to show you a brief demonstration of what it looks like to bring DHIS2 data into the ArcGIS online system to expand those capabilities and those and the analytic capabilities specifically. So what you're looking at on the screen here is our connector that we've developed um, at Esri to connect DHIS2 data directly into the ArcGIS online system for a live feed of that DHIS2 data. This repository uses what's called a Coop connector, which is an open source web server that our teams have developed for other elements of our systems. So it's regularly maintained. It just allows for relatively straightforward download of this GitHub repository and a quick transform of that data into a GeoJSON so that ArcGIS system can actually read that geospatial data to allow for further analysis. The data itself, and let me make sure that this is video is actually playing. I don't believe it is. So what we're looking at here, as I'm waiting for this to see if it moves, um, is basically the ArcGIS online environment. And so we have taken the data from DHIS2, specifically from the demo environment. We've taken the malaria cases as well as the facility cases and been able to add them directly into the ArcGIS online system. Is gonna be the, um, basically the ArcGIS online system allows for a relatively straightforward way to basically add this data directly to a map and you can click around. And so since this is case data and you're often dealing with aggregated or you want to be able to visualize that aggregated data to share it out to the public or even maybe internal stakeholders, um, this mapping application allows you to just do two simple clicks that allow you to look at either a heat map or bin that data into little different categories so that that live data actually has live aggregation and any dashboard or visualization that you would create. We also have a couple of different applications within this ArcGIS online system that allows for dashboard visualizations that are drag and drop, no code dashboard creations that would allow you to then bring in that DHIS2 data live into ArcGIS online. ArcGIS online allows for drag and drop, low code, no code, um, Dashboard creation, it also allows you to bring in other data. So through data pipelines, you can automate processes, automate analytics, and bring in any other external sources of data. We also in ArcGIS Online have something called the Living Atlas. And so I'll breeze through the demo once we actually get it here, but the Living Atlas will actually allow you to add over 40,000 data sets that our team have compiled, deemed as authoritative from our partners, and then been able to share with our users. That includes anything from global land cover data to canopy cover data to global temperatures from NOAA and NASA, organizations like that, as well as national and subnational boundaries, some population information, and allows for that type of visualization. Um, uh, full disclosure, Esri, and, and a lot of people aren't familiar, so Esri is um, not an open source software. We partner a lot with open source, and we have open source code projects like this one, um, but we do have a grant program for ministries of health. Um, yes. 111 countries worldwide are eligible for this grant. Um, this grant includes this software access um, for two years. And after that two year period, we actually have deeply discounted packages for the same list mm -hmm. um, of eligible countries. Um, we can process those grants very, very quickly within a few days. Um, and it's very straightforward. We also have distributors who are located in most countries. So it is the case that there would actually be staff and supporting um, um, 
uh, supporting every staff kind of on the ground in most countries yeah. who who can help um, uh, get things set up and do that sort of thing. Valerie and I also have capacity to do a lot of that support ourselves. Um, and we're happy to do that. So um, we'll have a QR code uh, at the end of the slideshow where you can um, go directly to the grant website, uh, look at the eligibility um, and read more about it. So in addition to the ArcGIS online environment, we actually also have a desktop environment that allows for offline use and analytics, and it connects seamlessly into ArcGIS online. And so through the Coop connector, your data actually can be visualized in the ArcGIS Pro environment live, assuming that you are connected. Once you are in the ArcGIS Pro environment, it allows for large-scale data um, analytics and combination and Basically, you could take all of that data, perform those analytics, and then export GeoJSONs that would allow you to then add it back into DHIS2 using the new vector inclusion that they have. Are we? There we go. Incredible. So one of the items that I'll briefly show you is actually going to be a suitability analysis. And so through ArcGIS Pro, we can add all of the malaria cases from DHIS2, bin them into hexagons to discover an area of coverage over where those malaria cases are. We can then also add in the data from the ArcGIS or um, from the DHIS2 facilities data, perform walk time or drive time analyses using our network data in Esri, and then combine that data with population data from our living atlas and perform a suitability analysis that will show us where we're missing out on coverage. And so while this data is using data from the demo environment, it shows an example of where you can see red spots or hot spots where you do have malaria, um, you do have malaria cases, but you don't have those patients that exist within a walking distance within two hours of a clinic, and you also have high populations. So it'll show you kind of that extra step of analysis and that extra step of look at those walk times there within those facilities, and you're looking at the dark green being 30 minutes and then going out to two hours within walk time, and then being able to combine those all into a suitability analysis. And this suitability analysis, like I mentioned, if we could look at it for more than two seconds, um, allows you to see those areas where there are malaria cases, people are living in high population areas without access to healthcare. And so that tells us that we could actually focus on those areas. And then you could actually add that data back into DHIS2 and visualize that within your dashboards. That would of the data that comes directly from DHIS2, showing where those malaria cases are combined with external data, allowing us to filter by province, district, and chiefdom, and zoom all the way in to get more information. We can also see cumulative cases over time, cases by sex and age, as well as the total population of areas affected. This type of dashboard can either be shared internally with viewers who are not allowed to actually edit the data because it lives live in DHIS2, or it can be shared publicly. This is our final example going all the way around um, of our facility data. And so those um, facilities are shown basically with different um, colors based on percentage of beds occupied. And so this dashboard allows the user to decide where in the area have enough beds, we're having a lot of beds that have large percentages occupied. You can then click around, interact with the map and see where the birthing centers are, where the highest numbers of PCPs are, where the highest numbers of midwives are, those types of pieces. You can also search directly for a hospital if that's what you wanted to do. So this is an example of what might be useful as a public facing application so that the users can actually get a sense of that live hospital data, that live facility data, and they can look for the services that they might need. So with that being said, and the fact that we are at time, thank you all so much for your patience. Um, and so right here, I'm just going to highlight our integration requirements is just that everything that you kind of saw it is um, a part of one whole system. And so they are all interacting with each other and they all come in one big package. And so the Global Public Health Grant Program, the
that Lance went over, um, that you can find more information there with the QR code on the right with the cute little dyno. And then on the left, you can actually find the DHIS2 ArcGIS GitHub repository. We're still working on um, implementing this in country. So if this is something that you're interested in, we'd love to talk to you. Um, this is our contact information if the slide will change. Um, so that's Lance. I'm Valerie. Our contact is there. We'd love any questions if you had them, and we'd love to show you the demo if you'd like to come see it. And we're around, so come talk to us. Besides doing your grant program for 10 years, maybe, because my experience. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So the questions uh, for people online uh, is what's the vision for 10 years for country? My experience, uh, so I'm work, I'm implementation team lead at Blue Square. Our experience with uh, proprietary software with license is that once uh, any grant or activity come to an end, they kind of begin to be a better worse. There is no funding following on it. And so, yeah, what's the vision coming from S3 for that and how we can bypass those kind of situation if you have like an opinion on this or not? Yeah, great question. Um, I think the the fact that you asked that, we can take that back as, as evidence that, um, you know, we at Esri can explore options with the leadership to actually offer those kinds of 10 year, um, those long range kind of packages. Um, it's not something we do right now, but if we know there's a demand for it, um, we can pursue it. That's kind of what I can say about it now. Yeah. I just want to say here, I've been dealing on and off with S3 for 35 years. And I've always found, and it's probably because it's owned by Jack Dangermond and not, you know, sold out to the sharks on Wall Street. S3 has always had a conscience. I have never had problems getting free donations of software for non-commercial purposes in multiple countries. So I, I just say, you know, among all proprietary companies, S3 is in the top 3%, in my opinion, when it comes to openness to earth. To, to okay. us contributing to society. I have to be honest, that's not what I thought you were going to say when you said that. Um, when you said I've dealt with Ezra, I thought, oh God. Um, but thank you, that's nice for you, that's nice to hear. And I'll add to that in the sense that I will say that Lance and I are here because we don't necessarily exist entirely within the global health space. And we want to, and we want to be able to support. That's why we built interoperability with DHIS too, is because we want to be able to help countries and ministries of health be able to take their data to that next level because we believe what you're doing is good. So yeah, we have another question here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valerie. Um, my question is, uh, how many integration projects you've done already, ArcGIS and DHIS too? And from your experience, could you give an indication for a basic level or for the initial stage of integration, what are the timelines? I know it varies on a lot of factor, uh, factors, but just as an indication, thank you. Absolutely, this is brand new. Um, so we actually have not done any direct implementation in country. So we would love to, we're really excited to. Um, and so I will tell you that this particular connector is relatively straightforward to use and implement. Um, we are pursuing options to make that even easier, potentially with an application. Um, and so once the connector is um, kind of set in stone, um, bringing that data into ArcGIS and online um, or ArcGIS Pro takes two minutes. So yeah, so the answer to you is uh, we haven't yet, but we're looking forward to, yeah. Other questions? Okay, thank you all so much and thank you for bearing with us. Um, if you wanna know more, please contact yeah, we're us. We're around. <laughs>